Hi everyone, it's Candace Smith and I'm going to chat today about uh, measuring waves and some deployment tips um, with uh, RBR instrumentation. Um, so let's get right into it. So here at RBR we measure the blue planet. So we make things like sensors, loggers, systems, and OEM. So sensors are uh, the actual element that measures uh, um, something in the water, like oxygen, for example, here. Uh, we have loggers, which include the sensors and battery and some memory as well. And then we have systems, which are uh, essentially, we enable other full systems to operate by, um, by being a, sort of a piece in an entire system. And the OEM, essentially we take our uh, existing sensors and change the form factor so it fits best into um, our customer's instrumentation. So here you can see this is uh, an OEM float uh, CTD. Uh, here on the screen, you can actually see a suite of sort of the off-the-shelf products. So we have some sensors here. You can see the connectors where you would power and get the data from. Uh, these four white instruments are our standard loggers. I'm going to chat a little bit more about the standard logger loggers later. Here, they're, they're typically CTD. For those of you who, uh, who are familiar with RBR, you may be familiar with the CTD. And here we have a compact logger. This is a solo uh, T, and I'm going to chat a little bit more about uh, the solos as well. So I wanted to just chat about uh, sort of measuring waves at RBR and the very first thing is to think about what you need to think about before you even uh, buy an instrument and so deployment considerations. So what do you need to think about before you actually uh, buy a logger? So the first thing uh, is the wave period or the sampling regime. So I would think that for most, uh, say, beginner wave people, that you'd, you'd probably know about the wave period that you want to capture. There's a particular harbor, and we're trying to capture waves between four and eight seconds, for example. Uh, and if you're probably more of a, uh, if you've been studying waves for a while, you probably already know a sample regime. So that's, by that I mean, uh, I want to sample one minute every five minutes, and in that one minute, I want to sample really quickly at, say, four hertz. So typically, you need to know one or the other before you even go into the field or before you even purchase an instrument, just so you know exactly that you have that right configuration. Um, the other thing you need to know is how deep the water is and how far off the bottom the instrument is. Uh, or how far it's going to be because that will actually feed into the wave period in the sampling regime that you can use and how long of a deployment uh, you want, uh, how long of a deployment you want or how often you can access the site. So during COVID times, maybe you can only access the site every six months. So you really need a logger to give you a six month or longer deployment. Um, and these first four factors are all things that we're gonna put into Ruskin, which is our software. And if you, for example, change the sample regime, that's gonna change the autonomy, so how long the battery or the memory will last. Uh, and if you change the depth of the water column that you're trying to measure, then that's actually gonna change the period of waves that you're, you can sample. So these are all important things to consider before you, like I said, even purchase a wave instrument. Um, Another thing you want to think about is the accuracy and the resolution that you're trying to get. We have a couple of different options for that, so I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. And the sampling features. So uh, do you want to process your own data? Do you want to use the wave processing with Ruskin? Uh, you know, do you need continuous data? Do you need burst data? I'm going to talk about all the different sampling features that we have for waves. Uh, and if you're not sure, just ask us. It'd be really easy to have a Zoom call with you. We can bring up Ruskin and show you all the different parameters and the setups to make sure that a particular configuration you're going to get the waves that you're trying to capture or the autonomy that you need. So in Ruskin, I simulated an RBR Solo D Wave 16. So if you called us up today and said, I need a wave logger, this is what we would recommend. So it's a small compact logger and it has wave processing. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later, but I just wanted to uh, show you how changing the sampling regime and the depths uh, affects the autonomy and the wave period. So when you simulate the solo D, this is first what you get here. Uh, you can see that the autonomy is over here. So this means that if you set it up in the default configuration, you're going to get 378 days of uh, out of the logger because it's limited by the battery and so the battery will die after 378 days. So um, 
if you change these parameters, so it defaults to four hertz uh, for a duration of a 10, 24 samples every 30 minutes. So with, wave, with the wave setup, the duration is the number of samples. So you actually divide uh, the 10, 24 by four hertz. Four hertz means four times a second. So you get something like four minutes if you do that. So essentially the logger is on four minutes out of every 30 minutes. Uh, so it's, it turns on four minutes of sampling, 26 minutes off. Four minutes of sampling, 26 minutes off. And it just keeps repeating that and it'll do that for uh, over a year. But let's just now just play. So uh, we'll, we'll tinker with some of these features and then you'll see how the autonomy changes. So I changed the duration. I kept the speed at four Hertz, but now I want to sample for, uh, for eight and a half minutes. And I want to do that every 10 minutes. So instead of being on for four minutes and then off for 26 minutes, it's on for eight and a half minutes and only off for one and a half minutes. Uh, so it's on basically 85% of the time. And you can see here that the autonomy changed um, significantly. So it went from a year deployment to a two month deployment, which makes sense because uh, initially it was again, four minutes out of every 30 minutes. And now we're, we're on 80% of the time or 85% of the time. So the next thing I'm gonna do is change the mean water depth. So here, it, I, I don't have anything. This doesn't really mean much because it's not telling me anything about the wave period. So let's change how deep the water is. Here you can see I changed it to 50 meters and now I'm given uh, a wave period of uh, 10 and a half seconds to uh, 512 seconds. So this instrument altitude, altitude is the same as if you're in a plane, that kind of altitude. You think how far am I above the, the ground? So instrument altitude means how far am I above the seafloor? So uh, right now it's at zero. So that means that the mean water depth is 50 meters and you're, your logger is right on the seafloor. Um, so this is the, the range that you get, uh, is between uh, about a 10 second wave period is, this, is the shortest wave period you can get. Now, if you change the instrument altitude, if there's a way to actually put the logger 40 meters off the bottom, so only 10 meters from the surface, you can see here now that the wave period, oops, wrong way. Sorry, so now that the wave period is actually down to a four second or, or almost a five second wave uh, now. So the closer you are to the surface, the shorter the waves that you can get. So if you play with these parameters, again, in your study site, you're probably gonna know how deep the water is and know kind of where in the water column you'll be able to mount it. So if you play with those parameters, that's gonna tell you whether or not you can capture the wave period that you're interested in. And again, if you play with the sampling, you're gonna change the, um, the autonomy, so how long a deployment you can get. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about the different actual instruments at RBR that we have and why you pick one over the other. So this is really comes down to the accuracy and the resolution, so those specifications. So here we have our compact loggers. Compact loggers are really ideal when instrument size is critical. So Nina is gonna talk about that she actually buries her instruments. So to get really, um, to, to be able to bury, to be able to use the Solo T, which is a small logger in a hole, it's a lot easier to dig a hole that will fit that instead of digging a larger hole to bury like a virtuoso, for example. So a lot of times size is critical for, uh, for people deploying instrumentation. So you can get a Solo D Wave 16 uh, or a Duet TD Wave 16. Uh, you can see these are the same, except this one has a, an extra a, a thermistor, so a thermometer to measure temperature. A lot of uh, people are interested in getting temperature data along with the uh, pressure or depth data. Uh, these are our standard loggers here in the, in the center. Um, the Virtuoso D Wave 16 is uh, the same as the Solo D Wave 16. The only difference is that this one, the Virtuoso, is larger, it has more uh, batteries, and there's a couple extra features you can get, but all the accuracy and the resolution, the specs are, are all the same. Um, the one thing, for example, in the previous example I gave where you're sampling at four hertz for eight and a half minutes every 10 minutes, the battery autonomy on the Solo D was around 60 days. If you got the Virtuoso for the exact same setup, you actually get a 300 day deployment. So if you want longer deployments, the standard loggers are probably the way to go. Uh, and uh, again, the Duo is uh, two channels. So the temperature and depth, so it's analogous to the uh, Duet over here. Um, these four loggers, the solos, the virtuosos, uh, and the duos and the duets, we recommend for, uh, for tide and wave measurements, 
50 meters or less of deployment. Uh, of course, we have loggers that go down to uh, 10,000 uh, meters if you need a depth logger, logger to go down there. But uh, based on the pressure sensor, it's, it's best to have 50 meters or less deployment to capture waves and tides. So if you want it to go beyond 50 meters, we would recommend our quartz Q or quartz line of products. They um, have a, a higher accuracy and a higher resolution. So essentially they can detect uh, waves from uh, either, they can detect even smaller changes in the water level if you deploy them shallow or if you deploy them deeper then you're, um, it's, it can actually detect things at the surface. So uh, this has the para-scientific, so it's a digi quartz pressure sensor in here. Okay, so the one other thing to consider is the sampling feature. So I talk about the wave, I talk about the, the tide options, and so now I'm gonna explain sort of all the different options that you can get and why you would choose those options. So all RBR instrumentation comes with a standard up to two hertz sampling. So if you ask for a solo D, it would come with two hertz sampling. Um, so if you know that in your study site, you can sample at two hertz continuously and there's enough battery life and that's enough, of, um, that's enough sampling to actually capture the waves that you're interested in, that's a great way to go. Solo D, no, no extra features. However, if you need it, if you want it tide averaging done for you, you can get the tide 16. And the tide 16 includes the up to two hertz continuous sampling, but also includes uh, an average burst data. So the TIDE 16, I'm gonna show you an example later. Essentially, you put in a, um, a sample frequency, just like the wave, uh, a duration. So how many, again, it's uh, instead of the number of samples, it's how long you wanna do that burst for. So you could do a, a four hertz burst for eight and a half minutes every 10 minutes. You could, you could do that in the TIDE 16. And it will give you the average of the burst data. So every 10 minute period, you get one data point. If you are interested in waves and you wanted to detect all the waves that were coming in from you know, whatever the, the wave period in Ruskin tells you, then uh, wave 16 is a really great option. Um, it gives you, again, this, we saw earlier, you can do a burst, but it gives you all the burst data and not just an average one data point. And it also includes continuous up to 16 hertz continuous sampling. So you could do continuous 16 hertz sampling, you could do a uh, tide 16 sampling where you're sampling at four hertz every eight minutes for 10 minutes, or you can do a wave burst uh, again with a different configuration. And finally, if you do get a quartz uh, instrument, it actually comes with everything I just talked about, continuous 16 hertz sampling, tide, wave, and there's also burst and average. And burst and average modes are really similar to the wave and tide uh, modes. Uh, they're just slightly different. Okay, so I'm gonna now focus on specifically the tide and the wave 16 options in Ruskin. Uh, because most people are probably gonna, you know, you can do the same, this, uh, you can do the calculations on your own to calculate the tide and the wave statistics, but uh, since this is a feature, I just wanted to go into it a little bit. So here we've um, simulated an instrument in Ruskin, and there's a drop-down bar where you can pick fast sampling or tide or waves. So we pick the tide. Again, the tide comes with continuous up to two hertz or tide. So here we have tide sampling, 16 hertz. Again, we're doing it for a minute every five minutes. So just note that this is slightly different from how we configure in wave because you're actually putting in how long you want to burst for in time, not in samples. And then you can see here that this uh, black line is the average tide data, which is reported. And then we, when we zoom in here, you can actually see the burst data. This is the one minute burst, um, but you, you don't get that data in Ruskin. So you, you get the average data. So if you're interested solely in tides or water level or, or pressure level, then the tide option is really great. Uh, but if you actually really want to look into the waves and get lots of wave parameters, then the wave 16 is a really great option. So uh, here again, we've simulated a wave logger uh, as I did earlier. And here it worked, the example is 16 hertz for the duration of um, 32,000 plus samples. And we're doing that every hour. So this actually will be about uh, 34 minutes. So the logger is essentially on half half the deployment, so it's on for 34 minutes off, on for 34 minutes off um, for the rest of that hour. 
And uh, we also put in the mean water depth and the instrument altitude. So you can actually see this range, this period range. And with the wave, you actually get all the burst data. So if you wanted to calculate different parameters or verify that uh, Ruskin calculated the parameters uh, the way that you would typically cal calculate the parameters, then you have access to all the burst data. So the wave 16 gives you a suite of uh, additional derived channels from the burst information. Um, you can see here, this is just a list. It's essentially the wave height and wave period in different, uh, in different versions of it. So the average wave height, the max wave height, uh, they're all here. You can see they're all converted into the right, um, the correct units. And this is what the data actually looks like for the wave in Ruskin. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of all of these features because typically you're probably interested in looking at one or two at a time and you can play around with Ruskin to turn off the ones you don't want to look at. Okay, so I will, now I want to talk about the deployment tips. So these are tips that I have over the past couple of years uh, listened to customers and got feedback on what exactly they're um, the best ways to deploy. Uh, essentially, the solo D wave is uh, really what I'm focusing on. So, or any really any um, pressure sensor, I guess, from RBR typically. So if you here we have a setup of a mooring. So you can see I just threw a float. Um, Boy at the surface, we have an anchor here at the bottom and some sort of a cable or chain to connect the two. So if you put the solo at the surface um, on the float, uh, it's actually gonna bob up and down with the waves as the waves are going by as the float bobs up and down. So the very thing you're trying to measure, you're, you're not gonna be able to capture it as the inch moves up and down. So it's much better to uh, mount it at the bottom because then it's stationary from the bottom with respect to the waves and now it's going to be able to detect the waves. Also make sure that you use plenty of weight so that uh, when you do mount any, you know, any sort of uh, wave detection system just so that your anchor doesn't hop. So uh, somebody I know tried to do uh, measure uh, hurricane waves and they didn't add enough weight so literally the, the whole buoy system was was hopping out of the harbor. Luckily, they caught it. But, um, you know, just it's always better to be safe and sorry with deployment. So it's always better to check the batteries and the desk and the O-rings and to add extra weight if need be. Whoops. Um, OK, so if you have access, the easiest place to mount something, I think, is probably off of a dock or a pier because it's stationary. It's uh, not going to move. And you can see the waves and tides around it especially if you have a high tidal zone like we do here in Nova Scotia, you can mount it at low tide and then uh, get all the data. These can be deployed sort of in air or in water, so you don't have to worry about if, it, if it's going to be covered or not. Um, but one caveat is that some people are curious and or nefarious and they might remove or steal or vandalize the instrumentation. So it's probably best to try to deploy if you have a friend that has a private um, dock or a pier or, or an institution that has a private dock or pier, it's probably best to do it to deploy there. Uh, I get asked a lot about how do I actually do, attach this? So um, you could just use regular rope or string, zip ties are common, tape both or combinations of all those things. Uh, it's, again, it's always better to be safe than sorry. If you have to use a lot of tape to make sure something's secure, that's better than losing a piece of instrumentation. Um, the easiest thing to weigh it down with, I would suggest, is something heavy that has a hole in it. Um, if you think about, if you try to tape this on to like a solo D onto a brick, that in theory, the brick could sort of slide out from the tape. So things like cinder blocks or weightlifting weights that have the holes in them that go on the bar, that would be really, really useful because they're heavy and they're, um, and they have a hole to actually to be able to attach easily. Uh, and if you're going to go on a mooring line, like uh, the first example I uh, showed, you can see I, we actually sell RBR mooring line clamps. Uh, here's the mooring line hole, and this is the instrument hole. So this would be sort of for a virtuoso or, or a, a duo. So if you are going on a mooring line, uh, um, that's probably the best thing to use. You can use a couple if you're in a really dynamic area, or just one um, if you're in a less dynamic space. OK. so. Uh, which way to face the sensor is a great question. So you can face it sideways, sideways, uh, you can face it down, but we probably would not recommend facing it upwards. Uh, 
the, the sensor upwards. So this, the pressure sensor is on this face up here. Uh, and the reason is that, as you can see here, uh, so the pressure sensor is actually this um, metallic looking thing, which you can actually see is inset a little bit. So there's a plastic cover here to protect the pressure sensor so you don't accidentally jab it and cause damage to the sensor. So this is a removable plastic cap, so you can remove it if you need to clean it. Um, but there's holes here. So this is a hole, this is a hole, one here and one here. And that's to let the water through so that the sensor can actually detect the pressure from the water. Um, and these, so that's really awesome because now your sensor is protected, but these holes can also let sediment in. So if you are in a very sedimenty area, like this beautiful beach here, uh, and you deploy the sensor, then now these holes can get jammed full of sediment. A few pieces of sediment it's, or any other debris, it, it's fine. It shouldn't cause any damage, but as time goes on then, um, if it gets, if there's more and more sediment that gets in there, then it could start creating pressure on the pressure sensor and give you a false pressure rating, uh, readings. And eventually, actually, it might get really compacted in there and uh, create a lot of pressure on the sensor and actually damage it. So if you can mount, if you have to mount it vertically, just try to mount it so that the, it's facing downward if you are at all in an area where you're concerned with things getting in the holes. Uh, it, it's usually not an issue um, unless, you, again, you're in a super sandy area. Okay, so that's uh, all that I have for that. Uh, we do have a couple upcoming webinars. Uh, so if you're around tonight, if you're in North America, and you wanna uh, hear more about the compact loggers, we have um, in our uh, Asia Pacific webinars uh, hosted by my colleague in Australia. And then next week we're gonna hear more about, so this is a perfect example, you can see the solo, D is actually mounted on a weight. This was not planned. <laughs> and it's mounted horizontally here. Um, and then again, we have another uh, Asia Pacific one next week as well. So I'm going to now introduce um, Nina and, sorry, my computer. Okay. Okay, great. Hi, Nina. Hey. I'm just gonna make sure, okay. Great. You guys see my screen now? Yes, okay. totally. Awesome. So Nina, before we get into uh, your talk, can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in uh, like oceanography or coastal studies or measuring, um, you know, using pressure sensors for measuring? Uh, well, I mean, that is, a, I guess, a really long story, but to make it, make it really short, um, so I will actually speak about this also with the first slide. So I'm, I'm really interested in naval applications as well as uh, coastline erosion, um, but we are looking at this from the geotechnical point of view. So I'm mostly interested in looking at these processes with regard to uh, local soil mechanics and soil properties. And here really not only thinking about the sediment as single particles, but really how they, do they interact as a bulk material. So that is uh, kind of the direction where we are coming from. And again, like with regard to applications, that's really a, um, a pretty broad spectrum, um, naval applications, coast erosion, fundamental processes of sediment dynamics. Um, myself, I had my first degree is in geophysics, and then I did a PhD in marine geotechnics, and then I actually did a postdoc and physical oceanography at Dalhousie University. Um, that's also Candace and I actually met there uh, back in the day. And so I'm here at Virginia Tech as an associate professor um, in the civil and environmental engineering department now. And I'm uh, in the geotechnical engineering group, but also involved in the water resources engineering group who also do coastal engineering. Awesome, that was great. Um, how involved were you in this project? Are you looking at the data? Did you do deployments? Are you kind of fingers in all the pots? So the, the person who is the most involved on the data is actually also on the line. That's Matthew Florence. So he's one of my PhD students. He's probably, uh, I have to admit, doing the more detailed and hard work on this data. Um, uh, I think I'm a little bit more like the overviewer of the project as well as the development. And so here you will see, I also talk a little bit about what we are actually interested in, what are the processes, and then uh, a little bit of a history, how we advanced uh, through different measurements uh, doing this. Awesome. 
And the last question, can you tell us one fun fact about yourself that maybe people don't know? Uh, uh, I would love to be a great surfer, but I'm a horrible surfer. <laughs> That's, that is a fun fact for sure. Awesome. Okay. Um, I will let you take it away, Nina. And uh, yeah, sorry about the beginning guys, but if you have any questions, um, you can pop them in the chat and uh, we'll try to answer them. And if not, maybe Matt, you can answer them or uh, we can get Nina to answer them verbally at the end. Sure. Okay, great. Thanks, Candice. Okay. So as I mentioned before, so the main motivations, we are interested in a sediment dynamics. So specifically here on the right side, you see these scarps. And um, if you look at a lot of uh, coast erosion models and you consider mostly shear stresses on the seabed, um, sometimes the model will not really reflect what we're actually seeing in particular under extreme events. So it feels as maybe some components um, are still missing and we're not really, really including. And so one of them, and this is not something we came up with, but actually for quite a while, people have been discussing is liquefaction. So the, the earliest um, considerations in coastal marine environments was probably in the 70s. And that was actually related to oil and gas rigs. So at that time it was observed that um, lags of oil rigs started sinking into the seabed in the North Sea during storms. And that could not be explained just by the regular scour process from the flow being inserted onto the seabed. But so this theory came up that if we have a similar process as we already knew from earthquake engineering, so you're increasing pore pressures to a level that the, the water pressure in the pores between your particles, between your sediment particles, is actually larger than the effective stress that is keeping your your sediment as a matrix, practically as a bulk material together, then you practically fluidize your, your sediment, right? Suddenly it's moving from being um, a bulk material soil with contact between the particles, but is actually moving to being a suspension. And then of course, if you have like waves, if you have currents, if it's a suspension, it's getting just being moved away. Similarly, for example, if you have a slope, uh, the slope can be stabilized through partial saturation, but if you would have these uh, excessive um, um, pore pressures, you can also, again, like weaken practically a layer in a slope and then make the uh, slope fail. So this is something, again, that has been also brought up for coastal erosion as a potential issue, um, as well as for scour. And um, to where scour holes are actually deeper than what we predict from um, considering just the shear stresses being applied to the seabed surface or the sediment surface. So if liquefaction would come into play, that would be practically adding on to that and making coastal erosion even, even worse. So that's something we are interested in and wanted to investigate a little bit more. So just to go back to this, to this process of liquefaction, what does that actually mean? There's multiple ways this can actually happen. And I will not really uh, go too much into detail here, but, but very quickly, and I will refer you to the uh, textbook by, by Zuma from 2014. I have the reference down here if you're more interested in these processes, uh, just to get an overview of what, how this can happen. So generally, we're talking about these three processes of either, either residual liquefaction. So that is very much in line with what um, people have earlier already um, uh, discovered for earthquake engineering. In that case, due to wave action, you can imagine you're shaking the sediment, and by shaking it, your particles are rearranging, squeezing on the pores, and then you're actually increasing the pore pressure by the squeezing on the pores from the particle rearrangement. Here on the slide on the top figure, you see this, this is a figure from the, from the Zoomer 2014 textbook where you have the surface elevation, you see the waves starting, and you see that the pore pressure is not only reflecting the wave signal in a, in a damped and attenuated way, as we would expect, but it's actually creeping up. And so this up creep is this, this pore pressure increase and that can reach actually your effective stress level or decrease your effective stress and then your soil liquefies. So that's one of these, these processes. And as I mentioned earlier, that was um, uh, really discussed early on in the 70s, particular for failure of offshore structures and since then has become more and more into the fore and is now more of a consideration for these offshore structures. Then something that Matthew is mostly working on is momentary liquefaction from vertical pressure gradients. In, the, in that case, the idea is that if you have um, attenuation of the wave to the sediment, 
um, and damping, and then you have also maybe a little bit irregular waves in a coastal environment. To just put it into very simple words, your wave signal that you had in the water column looks very different or can look different at different sediment depths. And depending on how it's changing, you may encounter moments, and I'll look to show some examples later for this, where suddenly at a deeper sediment depth, you have actually higher pore pressures than at a less deep or closer to the surface sediment depth. And then you would start triggering an upward directed flow. And then you could, through this upward directed flow, actually liquefy the sediment and again lead to a, uh, that you have a suspension rather than actually your, uh, your soil metrics. And then you can have a similar effect like in the horizontal between these pressure gradients. It's particularly something that Sleeve and also Diane Foster have worked on. So through these um, through these uh, horizontal pressure gradients, you can create a layer where you suddenly would move the whole layer to the side or liquefy a whole layer, and by that practically, um, again, erode much more sediment than you would otherwise. So these are the three key processes, I guess, involved here. So thinking about pore pressure behavior, so we, again, I pointed all these different processes, and this really affects then the, your pore pressure. It can be super hydrostatic, where you have these positive excess pore pressures and the risk of liquefaction. And then something I don't really want to talk about here much is you could also have a subhydrostatic pore pressure, um, but means you have a negative pore pressure would actually would stabilize the sediment, right? But again, so this is um, how much these pore pressure respond to different so, uh, wave signals depends a lot on soil properties and actually is fairly complex because also when, it, when we think about state of consolidation or porosity, on that high level of accuracy that is relevant for these processes, uh, we don't have actually that much information, in particular in these very dynamic coastal environments. So we are interested in measuring the pore water response to waves, tides, and we have even, and I will not talk much about here, um, under vehicles moving over the beach. Um, so one thing when we started thinking about that is that we did encounter that there's no really off the shelf sensor. So there's not a poor pressure uh, coastal pressure transducer available that is actually built for that. And that is um, when we started also the conversation with RBR and saying, okay, we would want to do this. Um, and we think we can do this with your, with your, uh, with your solo Ds. So there's a few aspects and actually the top challenge that I pointed out here is the one that Candace mentioned earlier, and that's about the sand going into the sensor. And obviously if you bury the sensors, this is even significantly more that's so the case. So, um, so what we use for this um, is actually geotextiles. So we use geotextiles that have pores that are just as large as possible, but just smaller than the, uh, than the grain size we are expecting. And so we practically apply a second cap over the cap that comes with the sensor. And that way we actually keep the sand out, even if we are burying them. Timing is for us really, really important. So um, we are actually comparing sensors, right? We are interested in gradients between these sensors. So it's important that the sensors, uh, that we can compare them at the, on similar timing. And then deployment is, of course, uh, uh, fairly challenging if you want to place them into different um, sediment depths. So safety of the personnel is really Im important. So if we want to go into the water, we're obviously interested in places where there's waves and in particular in coastal environments, you may not really always get these as calm conditions as you're hoping for. There's also risk of loss of damage of sensors. If you bury them, you leave them. Candace talked about anchoring. And uh, so we are using usually pipes for that um, and uh, pipes with an anchor or a wade or or just something that goes wider, and then we bury them deep enough that we feel uh, comfortable. But you can have wave conditions um, exceeding what you expect. We had once a situation in Alaska where, when, uh, where a storm actually picked up overnight much more, and in that case, we lost two sensors because we did not uh, chain them up to a higher uh, elevation location. And then uh, another big aspect, and I will talk a little bit later about that when we come to what we are looking at in the future is actually disturbance of sand. We wanna measure how it is in situ, but if we're digging holes, then we're obviously disturbing the in situ um, condition. 
Um, all of these challenges affect data quality and analysis. And so this is really, there's no real established method. While we are certainly not the only ones and the first people measuring core pressures in coastal environments, there's not yet really this established method. And there's still a little bit subject to research how to also do this. So our general approach, I already mentioned, we use the geotextile shield. Um, to be honest, in the very first attempt, we just used a perforated can that we put over it. But that was also due to a lack of materials because it was a bit of a spontaneous situation. Uh, we use, um, we anchor the sensors on a, on a pipe. Um, we synchronize the sensors to the same start time using, using the same computer. And then we deploy them so far that is mostly in the intertidal zone. So we utilize or, or a lower intertidal and upper subtidal zone. So we utilize really the idea of that during low tide, we put them out really quickly. And then, um, and then we let the water come in, but we also really have the goal to go um, into deeper water depths. Um, we want to leave them in place for at least two days because of the this theory that if you let about a day or like at least one big high tide of waves go over it, that the waves recompact the sediment to the in situ conditions. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about that later. And then we recover and actually analyze the data. So let me go with you through some, some examples. So the first time that we really did this, at that time I was still a postdoc at Dalhousie and I worked with Alec Hay and had the pleasure to join him and his team uh, to an experiment at Advocate Beach uh, in Nova Scotia in 2013. So Advocate Beach is uh, uh, at the Bay of Fundy and I'm sure many of you guys know that there's uh, really huge tides there. And overall, you see the lower picture on the left. And often the conditions wave-wise are pretty calm. However, you see on the upper picture that it can also actually uh, increase quite a bit. This frame there is about half a meter. Um, and this is practically the shore breaks uh, in the middle, in the center of the beach, um, crashing on them. So I just want to point out again, this was a first attempt. And so we had here one sensor 50 centimeters above the bed at the frame. And then we had one that was 50 centimeters um, below the, the, uh, the beach surface in the ground. And so as expected, um, a few features I want to point out, like is that the tidal, so this is like the five minute average. So the tidal cycle in both is really well uh, reflected, even off the buried one. Um, obviously, if you're higher up, the water comes a little bit later for the one that is in the water. However, um, what we were really interested in, I just have to move here quickly the, the figure. So we were really interested here in this end of the drainage, right? Drainage and infiltration. So that was one aspect that I found in this really early data set very interesting. So from this gradient here, you can see that you have an instantaneous infiltration. It comes quite with a little bit of pressure, but then if the app is going out, we're not seeing really that. So we see a slow drainage to the beach, but actually fairly constant, right? So you see down here, this, this constant drainage, and in a later data set, actually, uh, Matthew did a calculation on that uh, based on hydraulic conductivity. And from that, we could estimate what is actually the drainage path out of the beach. Um, so the other thing that we noticed in that, from that data set, so we had a storm event happening here. And we had a lot of days of calm weather. But during the storm event, we actually did see pore pressures ramping up. Um, this is a mixed sand gravel beach, so you would expect that it's almost impossible to develop excess pore pressures, but for just a short time of four waves or so, not sufficient for liquefaction, but we would actually see this temporary um, ramping up. And that was really something that was not really, really considered yet. And that sparked also my interest a little bit more to look more into, into uh, this. So then I, uh, I, I moved to Virginia Tech. I started my assistant professorship there, and that was also when I actually uh, purchased my first four RBR Solo Ds, my, my own ones from my own uh, research group, um, specifically talking to RBR about this, about this. And I think at that time, you guys still had mostly the six hertz um, wave sensors, but I think we, I asked for 10 hertz. And so I had this set of, at that time, 10 hertz, and then I think later the 16 hertz ones came. So we went then in 2014 and actually also the following years to a quite different environment. So this is Southeast Alaska. Uh, Cannon Beach um, has about a, a tidal range of one and a half to two meters. So also not small, but 
far, far smaller than uh, Advocate Beach, but very energetic wave climate. So this is actually considered the true north shore. Uh, I think that's just the same from Yakuta, but it, the place is actually known from pro surfers as a, a very energetic long swell uh, location. So, so here what we tried, we had this, this little frame set up and the RBRs are actually in the ground here when we had an ADCP on top and we had also a GoPro camera on top. And again, we deployed it kind of in the lower intertidal zone, still safe enough um, with some distance giving us some time, but then water uh, levels would actually go up to about like a meter or so. And so here on the right side, you see some, some examples of the data where you have the, the one sensor at five centimeter sediment depth and the other one at 20 centimeters of sediment depth at different times of the tidal cycle. So here on the upper right, this is actually at high tide. Then on the lower right, that is, uh, that is flood when, when you already quite a bit of the water is, is gone. And then you have um, the, the flood and the earlier ebb here. And so I just want to point out like, like a few key items that we learned from this early deployment. And that was that when it, the water gets really low, it's getting fairly complex because you're going into this combination of drainage and still incoming waves, right, that rush up there occasionally. During high tide, you have the most what you are expecting to see. So you, you have like slightly damped waves, but the signal is always a little bit smaller. At the deeper water depth, so you have this attenuation with sediment depth. But then in these other, where the water depth is more around, oops, sorry for that, around uh, 5, uh, 0.5 meters, 0.7 meters, you see that you actually uh, get these moments where the, where the pore pressure is higher at the deeper sensor. And so here we shifted them together so that we could directly compare them, not necessarily the most ideal way um, to display that here. But so the moments where the, where the P20, the black line is actually larger than the, uh, than the red line, the P5, that means that you actually have a higher pressure at deeper sediment depth and you would start triggering this upward directed flow. So the one thing that we were really inter like uh, surprised about is how often this actually happens. And these were moderate wave conditions. This was not even a storm. So we went a little bit more into detail using here the same data set. And we used uh, um, an approach by Yi and Mason that they developed in 2014, actually for a tsunami. So it's slightly different to estimate like when you would achieve the criterion for momentary liquefaction. And we applied this to this data set. And you see again that you have these, um, here the green line indicates that we had actually some moments and again, fairly often where this would, would happen and we would exceed actually the level for momentary liquefaction significantly more than what we have thought about uh, from the literature before. Very short and brief, but it happens more often than we thought. So this is work from, Florin, uh, from uh, Matthew Florence, my PhD student, much newer. This is data from another side uh, in close to, this, to uh, Yakutat in Alaska. So Matthew took this, took this much further. So he applied an equation by Maury et al. from 2007, where they investigated in France at a beach and developed actually an uh, equation that considers much more properties, such as saturation, for example, in intertidal environment to estimate when you would actually exceed um, the criterion for, for momentary liquefaction. And here with these differently dashed lines, you see a minimum um, pressure need and mean and the maximum. And then you see again the pressure difference here. And you see that again, there's actually in this, in this uh, about one hour time, you have multiple incidences where this is happening. And again, these are not storm conditions, even this is just like normal conditions. More recently, we started expanding on this further, and this is again work by um, Matthew. This is data we collected last year at the field research facility of the Army Corps of Engineers in Duck, North Carolina, where we had two of the RBRs um, on, on each pole, and we had multiple poles, and then we also had some uh, ADVs on top that was courtesy of Britt Raumheimer and Steve Elgar, who we are collaborating with on this, top, on, on this project. And again, um, we found here incidences where the, uh, the deeper sensor pressure is exceeding uh, the upper pressure, in indicating that there are moments 
um, of momentar potentially momentarily liquid faction. However, you also see that the ADV signal is quite different. So we are trying really to understand what is going on. And also um, we are really interested to now look more at the, the time or the duration of these incidences and how that relates to the wave phase and how does it really relate to the erosion we are seeing because it's not as if we are seeing that this whole layer is going away every single time we're hitting this this uh, incident so we collect great data but there's still a lot of open questions on that and these are a few next steps that we are pursuing so this is a design by matthew of the of what we call a, a pressure lens system so the idea here is to have practically one system that is modular and allows uh, practically shifting these boxes up up and down and that we can slide practically the, the uh, solo Ds into these boxes and have them um, really nicely localized on this pipe. While currently we are always doing that on the fly in the field and um, that creates, first of all, a lot of work and second, also sometimes some uncertainties with regard to the exact location and angles and stuff like that. So we are hoping that um, we get more deployment accuracy through this system as well as um, maybe through a, through a system of deploying this more efficiently can actually then also start slowly pushing into deeper water. Another thing that we, we are interested in uh, looking a little bit more into, this is also um, designed by, by Matthew in experiment design, and it's a collaboration we are hoping to work on with Brian Mulligan from the University of, uh, uh, of Queen's University. Sorry, I have the QU uh, the other way around here. And, Greg Simmons from the Royal Military uh, College, uh, both in Kingston, Ontario. And so we are interested in, in these challenges that I mentioned earlier, in particular on, on also the deployment, right? So if we're actually removing sediments and we are, uh, we are digging a hole, placing the sensors in, or we are, we are jetting them in, we're disturbing the sediments. So how much does that actually change our our properties and how long does it take um, the waves to re replace it into the in situ conditions. And then I just mentioned this aspect of duration of exposure. So how much erosion is actually happening. So Matthew designed this experiment where we would have different layers of colored um, sand and we could actually observe while measuring the pressures using our solo Ds how these different um, layers are eroding so that we have a, um, a better pathway to, to use our data to actually then predict uh, coastal erosion from there. So just a few quick concluding remarks. I know that I rushed a little bit through this. I hope I gave an overview over what we are interested in, um, how we got to where we are now and where we are going with this. Um, so a few key items is that um, sediment liquefaction under ocean wave is really not fully understood yet. There's a lot of open questions, in particular for the integration into coastal erosion mitigation and prediction. Um, if we are studying these poor pressures under different wave conditions, this will really assist us to understand these processes and then also really make a contribution to improving prediction and mitigation of coastal hazards. We found that the RBR solo Ds performed really well with this new task that they actually have not been built for, I believe. Uh, I think they were not built for being buried and measuring uh, pore pressures, um, which just small operational modifications, such as using the geotextiles, for example. And that's really uh, pretty straightforward to do. Um, the data has contributed to new insights on the pore pressure behavior. You saw that we have already published few contributions on that. Matthew is working on more papers on this. So, um, so the data has really uh, helped us pushing this topic further and understanding better what's going on. And then we are working on additional modification in the operational procedures um, that are needed, we feel, to really streamline the deployment as well as the data analysis process and get more confidence to that. Um, and again, just like summarizing, we really feel that these measurements have the potential to assist with local coastal erosion mitigation strategies. And this is all I got. I'm happy to take some questions. Um, thank you all for, for tuning in. Awesome, Nina. That was so great. Thank you so much. Um, I don't think any questions came in the chat box, but if anyone wants to turn on their mic and ask a question, uh, or if Matthew wants to come on and add anything, uh, I do have a couple questions, but I'm going to let other people ask theirs first if anyone wants to 
turn their mic on or um, or ask a question in the box. Okay. I have a question for you, Nina. Hey, Nina, how are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Um, maybe you said that and I missed it, but um, do, do you think the sediment size has any impact? So I assume you did what Candice said and then you deploy them upside down to avoid uh, the, the actual. Uh, for us, the upside down is actually a little bit more unattractive, right? So we don't have the issue of sand getting in there because uh, because we put the geotextile on top, so we can place oh. them in any direction. There's no sand getting in there. Okay. And and do you think the sediment size has any impact on on the pressure you're measuring? Uh, well, certainly on the on the attenuation and damping of the wave signal, right? Because depending on the grain size, you would have different porosities. Uh, different possible relative densities, right? And uh, and that would affect how actually the wave signal changes which, with depth. Uh, we are also aware of, and that's actually one reason why we place them at different depths, sometimes multiple, not only two, but multiple at different depths along one vertical array, that you can have different layers of different uh, sand bulk density, right? So you can have a looser, or it's even kind of expected that the surface is a little bit looser from just people walking on the beach or just the waves um, always stirring up things while it's a little bit more um, denser going deeper into the ground and that would also have an impact. So yeah, grain size is important and the packing. Uh, even you may argue that grain shape, right? If you have more angular shapes. So for example, we would be really curious and are actually planning to hopefully also deploy them in our, our covenant sand, particularly a coral sand environment where we would have these really complex shapes that would also create more pore space and we would expect quite different results. Cool. Um, Jonathan is asking, does RBR have any differential pressure transducers or any plans for development? Um, I don't know. That would be something I would have to check. I can write that down. Matt, I don't know if you know or... Um, I, I do not know. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, I don't believe so. Um, Matthew Florence, do you want to like pop on your mic? You said you had some questions. I might be able to answer yeah. them. Yeah, so one of them was what Jonathan just asked. Okay. <laughs> but if you were thinking about creating, since what Nina and I are working on are those pressure gradients in the sand, if you could have multiple sensors on one uh, stick, I guess, you know, one um, sensor itself, um, that would actually be super, uh, that, that would eliminate a lot of problems that we have. Um, but other than that, are you thinking of making sensors smaller? I mean, the, the solo, I guess, is already small compared to the other two that you showed, but um, if we want to get these, um, these uh, pressure gradients um, and we want to stack them vertically so they're all you know on the same vertical line then the distance that we can measure is limited by the length of the sensor because um, right if we put them horizontally and then we're putting them on like a piece of rebar then you they could like twist around the rebar and get sort of uh, messed up or you could mm -hmm. like cause some sort of weird bending moment on the, the sensor itself and we don't want to damage uh, them. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> I do have, I have some answers. So for the first, to have multiple pressure sensors on one instrument. It is possible, it's not pretty and it's definitely not small. Um, I actually configured one. It's on a maestro, which is relatively large. It's our like one of the biggest instruments that we have. It's still handheld, but essentially you would have our coda line of sensors. So they're like the red sensors. They're a, like about the same length as a coda D, but they have a connector on the end. So it's essentially using the maestro as a logger, and then you can have different cable lengths going off. Um, and because that was actually going to be one of my questions about how are you dealing with the, the clock drift among, like if you had six solo Ds, how are you dealing with that? Um, so we do, we can configure it. It just, it looks odd. It's very, and it's quite large and there's cables. So there's like breaking points. So for burying purposes, it might be tough. Um, and I don't know if there is uh, like plans to put multiple, like, I guess it's, 
how many and how close they would need to be together. You know, like that would be um, my first question, I guess, like how many sensors on one instrument and how, how close to each other they would be. And, you know, did you need to be able to move them around? Like we do do um, like thermistor strings, which is multiple thermistors on a cable essentially. So um, I, I don't think there's plans to do a pressure one like that. Um, and the sensors themselves, uh, yeah, the solos are essentially as small as possible. The diameter is really a function of the Keller sensor that we buy, the transducer itself. We don't make that. We just build all the other bits that go on it. So that's really where the limiting factor is. And the, the length, it's, you know, with the AA battery and then the space, like there's not much space inside the logger um, to make it much smaller. Um, but yeah, I mean, we like, we like getting smaller and smaller. So uh, maybe if the Keller sensor changed size, then we could get a smaller sensor. But right now we don't have anything like that. Your suggestion of having one logger for a bunch of uh, pressure sensor though would be, a, would be a, a sweet, because I can't even imagine the nightmare for the, <laughs> for the, the clock drifting at different rates over the different instruments, because you're looking at very, very short time scales, right? Yeah. It's, so Doug asked a, a similar question that, um, you know, is there a timing issue? So yeah. it's, it's a little complicated. <laughs> uh, so when you have multiple codas, so they're individual pressure sensors, it's so, okay, let's say you had a TD, right? So it's a duet. Um, essentially, it's the, the, the clock of the actual instrument is saying, okay, take the measurement, take a measurement. So it's all synced. The codas, it's a little bit different. They're, they're all sampling at different rates. So if you, like the customer that I just configured one for is doing 16 hertz sampling. So it's gonna be a lot harder to see if they're, you know, if you were doing once a minute sampling, you could see if there's a bit of a drift. So there is some difference between the codas that are all not going to turn on exactly at the same time because they all have a different, um, they're all just gonna have a slightly different response. But um, they should be within, um, if they're sampling at 16 hertz, then they should be within one sixteenth of a second timestamp between them. There's, yeah, I'm getting into like a lot more technical details, but um, there's also uh, talks about for a customer that has a big project on the West Coast to do uh, something like, it, it really comes down to your, how close does your clock have to be? Like how, what's the threshold for, um, how different they, the, the data points can be. And some customers have a much higher that it has to be like within 0 0.00 whatever one seconds. So in that case, we were talking about doing something else where there's a, but it's a very expensive, like big brain custom solution. So um, the, the Maestro solution, I mean, it, I think it can, it can work. Um, and it will like the clock drift on the solos is uh, 60, centim uh, 60 seconds a year. So with the, with the Maestro, it should be much better than that. Um, but um, the customers just, we, I think we just shipped this week. So we'll have to see how, how it works for them in terms of that. So um, I was actually going to ask you about clock drift. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so in, in that um, scenario where we had, you know, the four sensors stacked vertically or whatever, mm -hmm. um, the fact that we're looking at gradients means that the timing is almost as important as the magnitude of the pressure itself. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's, we have, so looking at the 16 hertz sensors, you know, uh, a displacement of 11 sixteenths, or sorry, um, yeah, 11 sixteenths of a second is enough to cause like huge changes mm -hmm. um, in, in what we're actually calculating. And so I, I take all of this, all the data and just throw it into MATLAB so I can manipulate it a lot easier. Yeah. However, when you showed me the rescue and stuff, I was like, you know, all that's that, you know, that stuff looks really cool. So I might have to look into that more, but I've just been um, calculating the de delay between the signals and shifting them so they're all happening at the same time. So it, it's not really, um, you know, technical or theoretical. It's very brute force. I'm just throwing mm -hmm. on zeros at the start of one of them to put them at the same time. Uh, that way, we, because if we don't have any delay in the signals, we reduce how large these uh, gradients can be. Mm -hmm. But there's, other than that, there's no way to, at least that I've found out to put these um, 
to, to cancel out the clock drift, I'm sort of just like yeah. duct taping the, the signals together. Yeah. So, um, so one thing about the clock drift is that it's also not, it's not something that you can like calculate over the year and, and fix that way that they all can drift sort of within 60 centimeters each or 60 seconds each. So you just don't know. So it's, it's very, very hard to do the, the calculation on it. The only thing I can think of, I think, I think you guys are using continuous sampling. You're not bursting, right? You're sampling continuously at eight hertz right. or four hertz. So the only thing I can think of that would help with that is if you did get the burst option, because then if you were bursting, like I was talking about eight and a half minutes every 10 minutes, then you're going to notice a slight drift at the big, you know, at the beginning of each of those sensors. But you can, again, bring all those back to zero because you're going to know exactly how many data points should be within this time frame. Does that make sense? That there should be a minute and a half of data, um, a minute and a half of no data in every single burst. So you should be able to shift them, shift the data back to a zero if you do burst data. So, uh, and if you want it to get like basically continuous sampling, um, yeah, you, it's, it, gets complicated. <laughs> we can play with Ruskin a little bit. Like if you, if you really want it to like really maximize, essentially you're continuously sampling, but there's only a minute or a little bit of time at the very end where it's not sampling, it should be easier. But yeah, fast sampling and continuous, it's so hard because you just don't know how it's supposed to line up. I One know. of the yeah. things that we did for that, uh, one of my good was to, uh, well, for us it was accelerometer, but I guess the pressure were the same. We would create a fake signal, we'd strap them all, and then create a fake signal at the beginning and at the, at the end, and assume a continuous drift in between those things. So you can use those, those extreme events to sync the two data set at the beginning and at the end, and you can extrapolate in time, interpolate in time, and assume that it's a constant drift in between, um, which it depends on the length of your deployment, I guess, but that worked yeah. out pretty well. But you were doing it mostly in a day, right? You were doing it over hours? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this, that's the thing that the clock drift is not linear, like Obviously. for the whole year. So if they're doing deployments, you know, days or weeks, then it might be a lot harder to, to do that method. That's, it's a good idea. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Clock, I, I agree. The, the clock the clock question is coming up a lot more um, for, for these purposes that people are bursting or wanting a lot of high frequency data. And um, yeah, so to basically to get a better clock, it, uh, it is possible, but it's uh, a lot of cables and things like that to make it work. But it's something we can chat about for sure. And then I have, I have two more questions. I Great. promise. And then I'll be. No, um, ask all the questions. I love questions. <laughs> um, so with the burst mode, I could burst theoretically four minutes out of every five, right? And just have like a minute downtime. Sure. So I'm still getting a majority of the data. Mm -hmm. So it's like quote unquote continuous. Yeah. So in the wave mode, um, this is like getting really, really technical about like the features that we have. So in wave mode, you, it's actually, you can't pick like, I want to burst for a thousand samples. It has to be 1024. It has to be the like 2048, those, whatever that's called, like binary or something. Um, because uh, of the, to calculate all the statistics, the wave statistics, we need it in that form. So you can't pick like 20,000 samples. But if you had the burst, just a regular um, burst sample, which is available in the Virtuoso, I don't believe it's available in the, in the continue in the uh, solos, I'd have to check. But in that case, you can burst. Um, you can burst whatever interval that you want. So you could say, you know, sixteen hertz sampling for like every single minute except that last minute, or every single second except that last second. Uh, you you could do it that way. So that's that's possible. But I don't know if that burst functionality is available in the compact loggers. But I I can double check that for you or if there's a way to change it for future models. Okay, thank you. Uh, last That's question. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, I would never openly disagree with my PhD advisor, but if we <laughs> were to somehow get sand, not mm -hmm. saying that there is sand underneath the plastic cap on my sensors, I would never mm -hmm. you know, admit that. But if there was, how should we clean that if we can, or do we have to send it back to you guys? You buy a bunch of new ones. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> you can, uh, all you need is a, 
I would say like a nickel, you can put it in, there's like a little line in the middle and you just put the nickel in, you can actually twist that, uh, twist that plastic okay. off. Actually, Britt, um, I think she told me once or Steve did that sometimes they deploy, they take the plastic thing off, which I do not recommend taking the plastic <laughs> part off altogether, but you should be able to and just rinse it really gently uh, with some water. You just, especially I think you guys have like 20 meter pressure sensors, like it, it, just be really careful not to actually like jab your finger on it. Um, and okay. yeah, just rinse it with some water. Yeah, that cap comes off. You can just like that. You have actually done that. that. We have yeah. done. I don't, know if, I don't know, Matthew, if you have done it yet, but but I've done that during the first few times when we when we used them. So we took off the caps and actually rinsed them under under there. But that was in the very beginning, I think. And yeah, we have sometimes a sand a few sand grains underneath, but certainly the, the geotextile makes it feasible. I don't think I would not bury them without the yeah totally because like i said it, a couple of grains you're okay but if it, it gets um, a lot in there then it's going to start pressing and then if you get too much in there it can really like fully press down on the sensor and if it causes too much pressure it can totally damage it so it's it's actually also to a question so instead of the plastic cap i think we would really like like a little screen that mm -hmm. has, has a like that is more like a geotextile or like a tiny sieve Matthew, wouldn't you agree with that? And then you would only need that and can pop it in practically like the plastic caps. Yeah, if it was a, like a mesh fabric or something, I think that, I, I mean, I don't know how, like if you had some fine sediments, you might run into difficulties there, but sure. if, if you had a, a screen that had openings smaller than your expected uh, grain size, I think that would, that could also work. That's, that's really great. Um, Suggestion, because all it is is that little piece of plastic. I mean, it um, it could be something that's as long as it's like pressurized or correctly correctly calibrated that it, that that it's not going to break under pressure. Essentially, I think that you could uh, even like get something three D printed where the thread was still plastic and then there's like a screen on it. So yeah, uh, I'm gonna write that down for like a, an improvement or doing because you aren't the only ones who are doing this. I mean, a lot of people on the list here. Um, that you have are using it, you know, buried again. So I get, I get some questions about like, if I'm burying it, what do I do? And then I'm always like, this is what Nina does. <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah. Um, that actually brings me to a question for you guys. So you, you said that they were, you know, there's no poor measuring instrument, uh, like officially. So you're using the solo D's, but what would be the ideal soul, like poor measuring device? Uh, so a better screen, being able to put multiple pressure sensors on one logger. Is there anything else that would be to make it better? Um, yeah, I mean, in an ideal world, it would be uh, like a, I would, in my perspective, the ideal world would be a merger between the, the lens deployment system that Matthew designed and the RBR. So that is practically one lens that you that has the sensors in there and you can pop them out i guess if you need to really replace one but it would be one lens and you maybe also have some shifting system um that would probably be like really really nice in particular like i mean from your question i understand i understand that you're also asking if you were marketing it for poor pressures right but because all of all of this currently like requires, as you can see, a lot of like um, uh, figuring things out, taping things together, you know? So, yeah. so I, think, I think that may, in particular, if you think about, I mean, this would also be really attractive and that's a direction that we haven't really explored mostly due to deployment difficulties, but for really monitoring at coastal, at like offshore structures, right? Yeah. But then you cannot do this like tape together system. You would need a lens that can be practically maybe even deployed without divers, but really um, that there's a certain deployment mechanism. But I think that would be, would be a really, uh, would actually catch a lot of attention from the offshore industry. In particular, if you think offshore windmills, you then not only have poor pressure changes from the from the waves, but potentially also from the vibration of the structure. Mm. It may come from the rotor or may come from wind vibration or may come from wave impacts on the structure. So I know that that's a concern, but there's not really a device in place to actually, you know, like do this. But again, for that, you cannot do this like 
tape together, you would need something pretty rugged, maybe with even some, some head you can push on pretty hard to push that lens into the ground. Um, Matthew, you probably have some additional thoughts. I was going to say, as, uh, as the primary person who puts these into the ground, something that would be very nice if it was just one piece and then, you know, so like a long rectangle that had a bunch of sensors just, I mean, you know, in, in the dream world where this thing exists, sensors everywhere vertically around the square pipe so you can get vertical, mm -hmm. uh, horizontal pressure gradients. Um, and then like a hollow inside so you could connect like a hose to it and just, you know, jet um, water through it and liquefy the ground so you can just push this in. Mm. Um, and, and of course, a clock that doesn't drift, but I don't think that exists. Um. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> the thing. You can dream the stream further and put like a, like a load cell that actually measures resistance doing pushing in or something. And then you would be really uh, talking to the, I guess, offshore geotech uh, community. Yeah. So the, I think the, the, the clock drift is a really good, um, is a really good suggestion because it's, because having four different solos, each of those could drift up to a minute in the, in a whole year. So you just don't know exactly what it is. Whereas if one instrument, if there was one clock shared by the instruments, then that should be minimized. Um, you know, like you said, it's, it's, um, yeah. I'm thinking of, uh, yeah, another, another application that we have that, uh, but it, it's to help with drift. Um, it's the BPR zero, but it's very, it's the Peros um, sensor. And it actually, I think it's more drift of the, the sensor, not the clock, um, but the clock is also important there. Anyway. Um, yeah, cool. Okay. Those are all good points. Um, so smaller, like a mesh cap. Cool. I'm going to also stop recording now.